So uh, my name is Jan Peterson, KD7ZWB. Uh, I live in Murray, Utah, and I'm currently the vice president of the Murray Amateur Radio Club. Our club does a lot of training. We, uh, we really enjoy making sure that people can learn something new every month. Um, we typically meet three times a month. Um, we usually break that apart into kind of a beginner level class and a more advanced level class. And I kind of geared this one to a little bit in between the two. So it won't be at the absolute beginner level and it won't be at the uh, advanced expert level either. So hopefully that jives with the group that we have observing tonight. And uh, with that, we'll take it away. So let's talk about APRS. So what is APRS? Uh, I've heard it called a lot of different things. The amateur physician reporting system, the amateur packet reporting system, the automatic packet reporting system, the automatic position reporting system. Uh, which of those is correct? And the answer is the automatic packet reporting system. So let's break that down a little bit. It's automatic. A control operator does not need to take action to make it do something, right? So you can turn it on and let it run and it will do its thing without you having to uh, poke at it, touch it, uh, click on things and all of that. It's, it's automatic. It is packet-based. It uses packet radio protocols. It's AX25 for those of you who are in the know. Reporting, it is used for disseminating information. So it's an information system. And it is a system, it is not standalone. It consists of multiple radios, multiple systems, computers, networks, all kinds of things go together to make the APRS system, the automatic packet reporting system system, actually be functional and do all of the great things that it is capable of doing. So it's not just about position reporting. A lot of people get caught up in the position aspect of it. And yes, it does have the ability to report positions, but it is not about positions. It has the ability to track vehicles, but that's not what it's all about. It's not designed solely to track your vehicles. And yes, it has the ability to hook into the internet over a wide area, but it's not about wide area usage. It is a tactical real-time information distribution system. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So tactical real-time information distribution system. It's tactical. It's not strategic. It's for local information. It is for information that should be useful and important to the operator wherever they happen to be. It is real-time. That means that it has current information or recent information. You don't care too much about what happened last month. You care about what's happening right now. Uh, information and system are pretty self-explanatory, right? We have information, we want to distribute it. The key goal of APRS is that you should be able to turn your radio on and let it collect information for a half hour or so and be able to see the entire tactical situation in the area. You should be able to see what repeaters there are, what nets are happening, where specific resources are located, any of that kind of information. And you shouldn't have to sit and monitor the frequency continuously for that information. The radio or your computer should be able to hold onto that information for you so that you can access it when you're ready to look at it. Okay. So let's talk about reporting tactical information. Things like where is a particular resource? Maybe an aid station, maybe a SAG driver, something like that. What bikes or runners have gone through a particular station? So say you're doing a race or something like that. You want to know who has been through your station. That information can be distributed with APRS. Where is the last runner or the last rider on the course? That can be extremely useful. If you are trying to close down aid stations, you want to know where that last rider or last runner is. Uh, what's a commonly used local repeater? What, the, what is the frequency? What's the tone? What nets are coming up? What repeater are they on? Those kinds of things are useful pieces of information. If you're new to an area, you may not know that already. You want to find that out. Uh, where's the local ham fest? Can I get directions to it? Things like that. Where's the local ham radio club meet? Where is, you know, where is it? When do they meet? That kind of information should be available and what operators are on the radios right now, 
what frequency are they using if I want to talk to them? So that's the kind of information that we're talking about accessing through APRS. What else can it do? It can do a lot of other things. It can do instant messaging. So we're talking about the traditional SMS type messaging. We're talking about that in the context of sending a short text message from one operator to another operator. But it also has links into through the internet, through gateways to be able to send actual SMS messages to somebody's cell phone or to send email to a person's email address. And there are also this facility for message groups. We'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later, but the idea being that if I don't know who to contact for something, I may be interested in a particular topic, I can send a message to one of these CQ server and servers, and it will send me messages that other people send to that topic. So I'll be able to essentially join a, a small group of people and find out what they're doing. Other things that it can be used for, I've seen it used for soda and photo spotting. Uh, there's also information retrieval. Well, with the Whois system, I can, if I see a, a call sign I don't recognize, I can send a message to Whois and it will send me back information about that particular operator, their name, where they're from, that kind of information. The WXPod is another service out there that will send me current weather information and the forecast. So those kinds of things are within its capabilities. It can also be used for telemetry. Uh, a lot of people who send up these uh, amateur radio balloons, the balloons have been in the news a lot lately with, uh, with the Chinese thing going on, but uh, amateur radio operators have been sending balloons up for decades where they want a balloon to go up as high as it can go or to go up for as long as it can. But in the process, they want to track where it is so that they can go retrieve their equipment when it goes back down. Uh, those balloons can send out telemetry, including their altitude and location, which can be tracked via APRS. They also find weather stations on APRS that have their weather information being sent out in APRS messages. I've also seen radiation monitors. They, there were some of those around like Three Mile Island when there were incidents happening there back in the 70s. Um, people were tracking that radiation through APRS, not in the 70s, but in the 80s, uh, looking for that radiation information. I've seen tide meters and river flow meters also wired up to APRS to send that information out over our app without having to run a phone line or, or pay for a cell phone to send at a location where you're collecting that information. Yeah. And basically, Dan, yes, you for a second. We're getting a request to have you speak up a little bit. Well, I'm talking basically as loud as I can, but maybe I'll, I'll see what I can do here. Can you get closer okay. to your microphone? It's in my headphones. I can't get much closer. <laughs> okay. unless, I'm wrong, unless I'm on the wrong microphone. Let me see. Is that any better? Well, not better. Okay. Apparently, my computer decided to use its microphone instead of the, the headphones microphone. So, Better. Thank you. We'll try that and see how it works. All right. So basically, it can do whatever you need to make it do, whatever you want it to do. Now, there are libraries out there that are available for different programming languages that you can use to make it do whatever you want. If you're a programmer, you can write code to hook into the system, uh, receive messages, send messages, figure out what kind of a service you want, write some code and get it out there. We'll start using it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the history and background of APRS. So the system was originally developed by Bob Berninga, uh, KB7APR. He is now a silent key. He passed away uh, last year in 2022. But he was a faculty member at the US Naval Academy and was involved in small satellite development. His classes at the academy were revolved around satellite communications and things like that. He wrote the initial implementation of APRS on the Apple II. So that gives you some idea of how it is. He saw a need for being able to get information dynamically from, you know, over a packet-based network without necessarily knowing the full structure of the network when, uh, when he started out. So what he identified was he could use that same equipment that is used by packet radio, 
i.e. a TNC radio and computer, and be able to get that information distributed through an automated system. We would ram into GPS to get access to the position of data. And this was around the time that GPS was first really coming out. GPS had been around for a while, but the government had put those uh, blocks on that reduced the accuracy of the system. And this was around the time that those blocks were removed for the commercial GPS side of the, side of the system so that we were actually able to get positional data within about 30 feet, uh, which was close enough to be able to do some really useful things for them. So how does it work? Uh, let's look at the hardware that's involved. So APRS uses packet radio technology. So you, there are basically three main components. You've got a display or some kind of an interface. You've got a TNC, that's a terminal node controller, for those of you who don't know that, and a radio that it's connected to. The idea is that your display or interface is typically a computer, but nowadays could be a phone or a tablet or something like that. A TNC it used to be a separate hardware device, and those are still available. You can still get them. But nowadays, we typically use uh, what they call a, a soft TNC or a soft sound modem. And those take advantage of the fact that the computer has a sound card already and can produce the audio. And it has a good enough processor nowadays to be able to run the modem uh, encoding and decoding within the computer itself. So typically, you'll see that those pieces of software like, uh, like sound modem will actually look like a TNC to other software using what they call the KISS protocol, which is kind of a stripped down, uh, KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid. It's kind of a stripped down communications protocol that depends on the computer doing a lot of the work, if the TNC not doing a lot of the work. Uh, and then typically it operates on a VHF radio. There is a standard national frequency that is used. So, all three of these components can be contained in a single unit. And if you've ever seen the Kenwood um, TM E710, like is shown here, you've got basically all the information right there, all, all three parts. You've got the display, you've got the TNC, and you've got the radio all in one unit. Um, we're, we're, I'm going to demo a handheld radio that has this functionality as well towards the end. Uh, basically, Kenwood and Yesu and Anyto have all manufactured radios with some amount of APRS functionality built in. And this picture is showing the TMD710, which is uh, a great radio that is no longer being made, unfortunately. Uh, there are still some out there for sale, but their prices are starting to go up because uh, they are getting kind of rare. Uh, there's also hardware devices that other people have built. Uh, one that I've seen is a Pico APRS. It's about the size of a box of matches plus the antenna. And I recently did a, um, a bike race, the bike uh, bike race for multiple sclerosis, uh, did communications for that. And one of the riders had one of these devices uh, tucked in the back of his jersey and had it just doing its thing while he rode, the, right, rode through the course. So that is just a super tiny, device, it's got the radio built in, it's got the display, and it's got the TNC. Another example is the CASU FGTV. It's got built-in APRS capability. So there are several different radios out there. I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list of them because I don't have that list, but there are several radios out there that have this functionality built in. All right. Uh, here's another example of a fairly compact setup. Basically, just any generic handheld radio and a device called the mobile link e which is essentially a kiss dnc and then an android phone with aprs droid software and you can see kind of what the interface of aprs droid looks like here we're going to do a demo of that a little bit later too so you can get a better feel for it but um, yeah so you really don't need a lot of hardware to make something like this go uh, you can also use a software modem like i said like direwolf or sound modem Combine that with a sound card interface like a signal link or digirig. You run APRS software on your computer, and uh, and your best results are if your radio has a data port, which will look something like this. 
uh, several different manufacturers have different kinds of data ports, of course. So the, you might end up having to make your own table. But uh, the idea is that you're getting the uh, non-discriminated output through this this mechanism rather than going through the microphone on the speaker port of the radio. Obviously, you're not going to find that on a handheld, but on a mobile radio you know, made by Yesu or ICOM or Kenwood, you might find something like this. All right. So like packet radio, stations have an ID and an SSID. The SSID is the secondary station ID. So the ID is basically your call sign. The SSID is a numeric value 0 to 15. And the reason it's 0 to 15 is because they only use uh, four bits to represent it uh, in, the, in the packet stream. Stations also have a symbol or icon associated with them that can re represent visually what type of station it is. We'll see some more examples of this later, but the idea is that you can visually look at the display and see what kind of resources are out there. It uses the X25 protocol, or it's actually the AX25 protocol, and is connectionless. You don't have to specify where the traffic is going to go. It uses a uh, uh, mechanism in AX25 called UIView, which is a flood fill type of algorithm. And the recipient address in the packet is replaced with a keyword that indicates the type of equipment. So it's not sending it to a call sign, it's sending it out to this kind of generic ID that says what type of device is actually sending it. So let's dive into the protocol a little bit. APRS is a packet radio protocol. It's going to encode the data into packets. Those packets are transmitted on the air and received by other stations. They're one to many. They use this flood fill type of algorithm for dispersing the information. So all stations within range see all the packets, right? They're not directed. It's not like I have to have, uh, I have to have been specified as the recipient of the package in order to see it. Uh, packets are digipeated generically using well-known aliases. So no knowledge of the underlying network topology is required. If you guys have worked with packet radio before, you've probably seen, you know, you have to specify, I want to go from this machine to that machine to this other machine. And you have to know the route that your packets are going to take in order to get them delivered. With uh, APRS, you don't have to do that. You don't have to know anything about it. It uses uh, the data link layer, UI frames, and I've written connectionist mode, I mentioned that already. And physically, it uses AFSK and coding of the data, typically at 1200 baud. I have seen 9600 baud views on UHF frequencies, but uh, in general, APRS typically runs on the two meter band and it uses 1200 baud. So I mentioned the nationally defined common frequency. In North America, we use 144.39 megahertz. Other countries or regions may use a slightly different frequency, but the idea is to have it be fairly the same in the region that you're in, so that you don't have to think about, oh, is, you know, what frequency, do I need to change frequencies because I went to a different state or I went to a different country or something like that? The idea is that, it's, so say if you're in Europe, everywhere in Europe is gonna be 144.8 megahertz. Everywhere in the US is gonna be 144.39. Right, so that's kind of the idea. Uh, we want to reduce the amount of configuration that you have to do to your equipment while you're traveling around. All right, let's talk about the protocol a little bit. So APRS revolves around two basic concepts. You have messages and objects. The messages can be one way or two way, two way being send a message and receive a response. Uh, objects can be things like stations, persistent objects like a repeater or something like that, or temporary objects like, say, an aid station or a, a rider in a race or something like that. Uh, key factor is the decay or limited lifetime of objects and information. APRS really cares about real-time information. Stale information doesn't really help you. Remember, this is a tactical system, and it's for local information. And so if it's not something that's recent, we don't really care about it. We don't worry about it. The BRS has a net cycle time of 10 minutes for local information. So if you're directly hearing a station, then that you should be able to hear that every 10 minutes. It should be updated every 10 minutes. 
the station should normally begin on a 10 millimeter. The target time for stations that are two hops away is a 20 minute cycle and three or more hops away is a 30 minute cycle. That's why I said at the beginning of the presentation, you should be able to turn your radio on for a half an hour and be able to see the full picture of what's going on for all stations that are within range of you. Uh, APRS messages do not have guaranteed delivery. Now, APRS clients may try to simulate that by applying a message sequence number or something like that and expecting an acknowledgement. And typically they will retransmit until those messages get acknowledged, but there is no guarantee that the message will be delivered, right? So you may find that if you've sent a message to someone and their radio is not on, you're never gonna get that acknowledgement. Your radio will continue to try to send it periodically. It'll back off a little bit so that it sends less and less frequent, frequently as it goes on. Eventually, an unreceived message will time out. Typically, the default for that is about two hours after you try to send the message. So remember, we don't care about stale information. So if I send a message to someone and it takes two hours and it still hasn't gotten to them, it's just going to get dropped. I'm not going to try to resend it anymore after that. Uh, object and objects and items are the other key concept. Objects include stations and non-station objects. Operators can place objects on the map, and once you place an object, they're automatically distributed across the network. Okay? Objects can have positional data, course and speed information, timestamp and expiration data, and they can carry additional information such as thermometry. We're going to look at some objects when we get to the demo course. Now, they can also include geometric shapes, lines, circles, etc. So if you are dealing with, say, a fire, like a wildfire, and you want to identify the region where that fire is, you can actually draw that as an APRS object and it will get sent out with those coordinates and other people can see it on their maps. Uh, items are similar to objects, they don't carry a timestamp, so they, uh, they typically are more static than that. Any operator can take over an object or item by transmitting a new one with the same name, or you can destroy it by sending a kill code for that name. So there's no ownership of objects. Objects are basically all the objects are sent out there. Anybody can take it over. Anybody can do that. There's no like locking an object in place so that only I can believe it or something like that. So objects versus items. The typical distinguishing factor is items are used for inanimate objects like checkpoints, aid stations, etc. Objects are used for moving items like stations, runners, spacecraft, things like that. So that's kind of the, the thought process in objects versus items. APRS uses generic digipeding. So digipeters will accept several aliases that they're digipeed for. And these are, are called paths in APRS. And they typically decide or define how many hops are desired and how many hops are remaining. So we use what was called the new end paradigm uh, we call it new, even though it was adopted in 2004. Now, for uh, those of you wondering, I first got my license in 2004, and that's when the new N paradigm started being used. Previous to that, they used targets like relay, wide, and trace. They don't use those anymore. So if you encounter those, whoever is still using those has really out-of-date configurations on their equipment, and you should probably let them know. New uh, the new end paradigm, everybody uses a path that looks like wide n dash n with an appropriate value for n. And the n is telling how many hops to make and how many hops have been made. In general, you don't want to use a value for n greater than two, except in areas that are very sparse or rural and very flat. If an area is mountainous and has digipeters up on the mountains, you don't need to use a high value because if you do use a high value, you're going to get your packets set much farther away than you want them to be set. Um, if you're in an area where there aren't any mountains or uh, DJ Peters mounted on tall towers and uh, it's very rural, you might use three to be able to get your messages as far away from you as you want them to get. So what does wide and, and actually mean? Let's say you specify a path of wide 2-2. What this means is when your packet's received by a DigiPeter, 
it'll decrement that first N and retransmit it with a new path of wide 2-1. Actually, I think that's 1-2. Uh, the next digipeter, no, I guess it is 2-1. The next digipeter will decrement it again with just wide 2, and any other digipeters will ignore it. They won't retransmit it. Uh, I actually have an animation that shows that. We'll get to that in a minute. So when you think about setting up your equipment and you're trying to decide what path you want to put in, this is a, a good way to determine what path you should be using. So let's say you're a mobile station in a dense area. You use wide 1-1 comma wide 2-1. This will take advantage of fill-in digis and home stations that can give it you. In general, your packet will typically only take two hops. Because remember the first time this wide 1-1 is going to go away. And then the second time, it's going to be a wide 2, but already think it's been used once because that second digit is a 1. So it will only make two hops the most. If you're a mobile station and you're in a sparsely populated area, and by sparse, I mean sparsely populated by APRS stations, then you're going to use wide 1122, and it may make up to three hops. The first hop will eat that first wide 11, and the second hop and third hop will consume the wide 2 2. And this will take advantage of both fill in digis and major digipeters. Your packets will go up to two hops a day, up to three hops a day. Let's say you're a mobile station where digis are usually on mountains, like in the Western US. You're just going to use wide 2 2. You won't be worrying about any fill in digis because you don't need to. You can probably see visually line of sight to the main digipeters anyway. Your packets will typically take no more than two hops. Now, out here in this area, that can be hundreds of miles, probably more than you want them to be. Um, this is the only path that's acceptable in Southern California. Otherwise, your packets will go too far away to be useful. Uh, in, in Southern California, they have actually made their own determination of what their routing should be and where their computers are. And they're, they have a pretty good set of health. So what about if you're a fixed station? You've got a good antenna. You can see the main digipeters. You want to use wide 2-1. The packets will still make one hop through those digipeters, and that should be enough. Uh, I see I've misspelled enough. Uh, what about airborne stations like an airplane or balloon? Just leave the path plain. If you're at high altitude, your direct traffic should be able to be received by everybody who wants to see it. In fact, it'll probably be received by people who don't want to see it. Um, Remember, we want to keep our RF traffic relatively local. People 500 miles away don't care what time our local net is or what our repeaters are. We want that information to be local because it's tactical information for somebody on the ground right here, right? We want that tactical local information. All right, here's my animation. Hopefully this comes through the Zoom okay. So the mobile user sends his packet, the fill-in digipeter strips off that wide one, one and then the main digipeter eats the wide two and it distributes it out to other digipeters and other stations. So when I saw this animation the first time, it was like, that's really cool. That's exactly what's happening. And it actually explains it visually in a way that I wasn't able to describe in words very well. But you get the idea that now. Anybody who's in any area around any of those additional wide coverage digipeters is going to receive my packet, right? Oh, excuse me. All right. Sometimes you're going to be in a situation where you want to use a special case for your path. For example, temp and N can be used for temporary digipeters, for example, at a field day setup or something like that. I've also seen uh, state identifiers used used for a specific state. So example, here in Utah, we would use UT 2-2, for example, and then we would be guaranteed that it would not go out of Utah, it wouldn't leave the state. Um, that's probably less important in a state the size of Utah than it is in a state the size of, say, Delaware, but that's the basic idea there. Uh, I've also seen link NN used, and those are typically used when you have a long chain of connected digipeters and you're trying to get a packet from one end to the other. There's a, a project every year called the Appalachian Trail Golden Packet, where people go up on mountaintops along the Appalachian Trail and set up digipeters with the goal of being able to send an APRS packet from one end of the chain 
at one end of the mountain range all the way to the other end of the mountain range. So they're going to use a very special path in order to make that happen. Uh, I think there's like 15 stations involved, 15 digit feeders involved in that process. And so they use a path that allows the information to travel that distance, but they don't use wide for that because they don't want it going 15 hops away from wherever it's being sent, except along that particular path. Uh, first thing to remember, uh, question might be, well, why don't I just always use wide speed three? I know my packet gets out as far as it, as it needs to, maybe farther than it needs to. The first thing to remember is the bandwidth of this system is very limited, okay? It operates on a single frequency. Only one station can transmit at a time. If two stations are trying to transmit at the same time, you end up with a collision and the stations have to retransmit. Every station is trying to beacon something every 10 minutes. And if a packet goes through a digipeter, it uses twice the available time. And remember, I send it, that uses a certain amount of time to send my packet. And then the digipeter resends it on the same frequency. That's going to use that same amount of time again. If I'm using wide 3.3 and it's going through three hops, that's using, what, eight times the traffic or eight times the time to send that message. APRS runs at 1200 baud. It can realistically support about 60 to 90 users in a local area. More than that, and packets will start getting dropped. Um, it's hard to tell if your network is overloaded, if it's say 800% overloaded and only passing one out of eight packets, or if it's only 50% loaded and it's passing 100% of your traffic. You can't really tell that by listening. You have to do some calculations on received packets at various locations to be able to figure out if your, if your network is overloaded or not. Um, just listening to it on the air is not going to tell you that information. All right, you may have heard of the PHG and Aloha circle. So PHG is a calculation or a, a value that you can send that indicates the power, height, and gain of your station. And that's information that you would send in your packet that's trying to give an indication of how much power you're using to send it, the height of your antenna, and how much gain your antenna has. And those factors can control how far your packet can get. Typically, in a location like I am, where there's mountains all around and digipeters all around, I don't need to worry about that. But if you're out on the East Coast where it's relatively flat, for example, or in, say, the Midwest where it's relatively flat, that information can be very helpful for you. Uh, some software will generate what is called an Aloha circle. And this is an a example of that on some of the uh, original APRS DOS software. And what that's trying to show you is who can hear me directly, right? So stations that are within that circle can hear me directly without going through a digipeter. Stations that are farther away than that circle, it has to go through a digipeter to get to them for them to be able to hear. So if you look at the stations in the circle, those are the ones that can hear me. If there are more than 50 or 60 in the circle, I should be using a small, a shorter path, right? Path settings, kind of black magic. You kind of have to experiment and see what works for your area. And you want to talk to other APRS users in your area, find out what they're using. And everybody should try to standardize on, on the same type of a configuration. You don't want to be that one guy who's using wide 3.3 and spewing your packets halfway across the country. Uh, you, you want to work together with your other operators that are around the area. All right. So how does this get online on the internet? There are special category of stations called an I gate, and what they are are gateways that take that APRS message traffic and move them onto the internet and back off of the internet and onto RF. Now, some people will run receive only I gates. Those are receivers that receive the RF packets and send them out on the internet but they will not send internet received packets back out on RF. We discourage people from sending their, their system up in that fashion. And it doesn't do me much good for my packets to get to the internet if I can't get response packets back, right? So we want to use bi-directional I gates. There's a collection of servers online that manage the traffic. These are called the APRS IS or internet service. You can think of it like a networked uh, collection of digipeters, right? 
So all of these machines talk to each other and they route the packets in a similar type of flood fill algorithm, but across the internet. They automatically eliminate duplicate packets. So for example, if a packet was received by more than one eye gate, uh, that'll get removed as soon as it, the, that packet hits the same system uh, in its progress through the APRSIS. They, it'll, it keeps a, a record of packets that it's seen. So if it sees the same packet twice, it won't send it the second time. So packets typically only exist once on the APRSIS network. And all traffic on APRSIS is assumed to originate or destinate on RF. So all of the amateur radio operating rules that apply for RF also apply to traffic on APRSIS. So if you're writing a service that's gonna sit on APRSIS and gateway traffic to some other system, we need to keep in mind that responses that come from that other system we want to make sure that they are not containing things that are illegal to send out over our pack. Okay. There's a lot of cool things you can do with APRS. I already mentioned some of these. These are servers that are out on the APRSIS. They're tied to the APRSIS and they receive all of the traffic that is sent via APRS worldwide. Uh, SMS gate will receive that those packets and if they're formatted in a particular way, it will actually construct an SMS message and send it out over the uh, cell phone network. And responses that are received via SMS can be sent back through RF or through APRSIS and back through RF to the originating station. Uh, the email to gateway can send and receive email via APRS, so an actual email message it requires some configuration and pre-planning before you do that, but uh, it's talking about the scope of how to do that is probably outside the scope of this, this presentation. Uh, I mentioned the Whois server before, where I can get information about a call sign via APRS, uh, CQ server and N server for group messaging, WXBot. The SOTA server is for some that's on the air integration, and there's a service called SOTA to APRS that can automatically spot you when you get near a summit. There are other servers that handle things like POTA and, and other systems like that. One of the cool things you can do with APRS is automagic tuning. So in your position or your beacon packet, you can have it include the frequency that you're on and tone if necessary, if you're on a particular repeater in your report. And so somebody receiving that packet can press a tune button on their radio and automatically set their radio to the same frequency and tone and settings that are required for them to be able to talk to you. So that's kind of a cool feature. Uh, there's also a concept of what they call voice alert. The idea here is you keep your volume turned up, you set your radio to use a PL of 100.0 Hertz. Um, it's different tone in other areas. For example, Europe is 136 and Australia is 91 but you set your, your radio to have that PL. So you don't normally, you don't hear most of the APRS traffic, but when you're within simplex range of another station that's configured for voice alert, you'll hear their beacon on the, on the, uh, on the channel, on the frequency, because you left the volume turned up. And then you'll know that they are within simplex range of you, and you can make a quick voice call on the APRS frequency and say, hey, I heard you on APRS, let's QSY to some other simplex frequency and talk. And then you get off of the APRS frequency and, and have your conversation on different frequency. You don't have a long conversation on the APRS frequency because remember when you're talking, no packets are able to go through, right? And we already talked about how there's very limited bandwidth on the system. All right. Another system that is, was developed is a thing called APRS TT or touch tone. You can have a very simple decoder that listens to audio traffic on a repeater, for example. And when it hears DTMF tones, it can decode them and turn them into an APRS object that it can push out over the APRS network. So that people without APRS capability in their radio, I should say radio, not phone, can still publish their location information based on a simple mapping and a published map or diagram. This is typically used at ham fests or things like a race where you may have 
um, a mile marker. For example, at a marathon where you've got a mile marker every 26, you know, there's 26 of them within a mile. If I send the touch tone code 26 and then a few extra digits that indicate what my station is, then somebody can receive that information and see on the map which station I'm, which aid station I'm at, or which mile marker I'm at. Remember the goal of APRS is to get that tactical real-time information. So we wanna find a way to get that information out there. All right. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna do some demos. Looks like we're doing okay on time. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is APRS.fi. Okay, can everybody see my browser window here? The uh, I sign or yep. thumbs up or something. Affirmative. Okay. Looks good. Okay, so this is APRS.fi. This is a web service that's run by a guy in Finland, hence the .fi, and it receives information over that APRS IS and presents it in a nice web-based interface, which is really cool. And so this is my local area here. And you see there's a ton of like weather stations. All these WX guys are weather stations, right? Um, I don't necessarily want to see that. Let me see if I can get this go away. All right. So what you can do is actually filter the information that you're seeing. And so one of the things that I have as a filter called um, APRS stations. So if I turn that on, then all of those WX stations should go away theoretically. Let's see. Just refresh, oh. refresh your page. APRS. Okay, this is the one that I wanted. So this strips out any of those that are not uh, actual, that are just coming through the APRS IS, right? Uh, for example, those weather stations. Um, so you can see here on this map, here's a vehicle that's moving and you can see it's left a trail and those little highlighted dots are the actual times that it has sent out a position report. So if I look at that, you see when I mouse over that, I don't know if you can see that line up here, but that line shows where his packet was sent. So it was sent to that digipeter up on the top of the screen. And then if we, let's drag this down a little bit. We can't really see. Uh, let's see if we can get that on there. So that sent it to the digipeter shepherd, which is on a mountaintop. And it, so his packet was received by shepherd. And then from shepherd, it made it over to this station way over here on the bottom left corner. And that's where the eye gate was that actually gated it onto the internet. So his packet was sent out over RF, Shepard digipeded it, and it was received by this guy down here, KA7KDX, and he sent it out onto the internet. So because I'm connected to this over the internet, I could actually see his packet because it was gated through that. We can also see on here, let me see if I can find some other items that we can see. Um, there's a, another Digipeter here, KF6RAL on top of the mountain over here. Uh, here's one right down here. Can, can you guys see my mouse where I'm drawing and moving it around here or not? Yeah, it's fine. I can yes. see it. So you see a little radio tower here, right? And this yes. is an object that somebody has published. You can see it has a frequency here. If I click on that, I can get a little pop-up that shows me more information about that. So I can see that this repeater is at 449.25 megahertz. And uh, I can find out what the tone is. The tone is 118. Uh, the offset is minus five megahertz. And there's some information about whose repeater this is in 7hrc.org uh, is a website I can go to to find out more about this guy. But that's a, an object that somebody has published. Uh, KB7STN-3 published this object. And I can see that where that repeater is. Now, obviously, there are more repeaters than that here in the Salt Lake area. But 
for whatever reason, people have not published those other repeaters. And that's a problem that you have in places where APRS does not have a wide um, interest group or a wild, wide uh, level of deployment. Not many people are running APRS. Uh, people who are running it don't really care if they put out that kind of information or not. So I'm not seeing the kind of information I would like to see from that. I'd like to see other repeaters that, that are in this area so I would know what repeater I should use when I come out here uh, if I'm not from the area. Um, up here in, here in Logan, you can see some other activity going on as well. So uh, you notice these different icons, like this is a little house, this is somebody's QTH, this is a little truck, this is somebody's vehicle, right? Remember I talked about those different icons that can be used to identify the station type? Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. There's a little car over here. Um, KI5FUN is uh, an amateur radio operator who was a SAG operator at the bike race that I did last weekend. Um, and he had APRS in his vehicle. So during the race, we could see where he was along the course. And the guys at Net Control could see that information and know where he was at without him having to tell them over uh, a voice connection. So pretty cool. And APRS.fi has kind of this global information, right? It's it's very wide area. Let's see if I can move this out of the way here. So if I zoom out, you can see there's a lot of APRS stuff going on in this area out here in Utah, northern Utah. Once you zoom out a little too far, it switches to what they call a heat map view. And so I can see where there's dense APRS activity and not so dense. So if I zoom way out, you can see what areas of the country have more APRS activity going on. So you can see over here on the East Coast, there's a lot more adoption than there is out here in the West. Now, for example, most of Montana has no APRS activity at all, uh, which is just sad if you ask me. I, I used to live in Montana and um, I would love to see more activity up there. Of course, there's only 800,000 people up there, so I guess that makes a difference. But you can get kind of this global view of how APRS is being used. Here it is in Europe. Europe is pretty heavily populated with APRS. So if we zoom in over here, you can see at some point when I zoom in far enough, it'll switch to a station view. I can actually see individual stations. I should see them. There they are. So you can see how busy it is over here in Europe, right? There's a lot more utilization over here. All right. So that's APRS.5. Um, now I also wanted to show um, a couple of local clients. So the first one I'm going to show is. This one is called Yak. Yet another uh, what is it? APRS client. Yet another APRS client. Y A A C. And you can see it uses OpenStreetMap to to populate its map. And uh, you can make adjustments on what things are visible and what things are not. But basically, you're looking at the Salt Lake Valley right here. And if we go into um, configuration here. You can see the ports that are set up. And I've actually got two ports set up for APRS IS traffic. I don't have any RF ports set up on this. But if I wanted to look at one of these, this one is configured with a filter. So when I connect to the APRS RS, I can say, hey, I'm only interested in things that are within 100 kilometers of this particular latitude and longitude, which is where I'm at, right? So APRSIS is not going to send me things that are way outside of my, my area. And the idea here is that, remember, we're talking about local information, so I only care to see it if it's local. This one, on the other hand, does not have a filter configured, 
And so this will see all the traffic for the entire world. If I was interested in seeing that, I could turn this one on and receive all of that information. Uh, I'm not going to do that. We turn this one on. And you'll see stations starting to appear over here. You see the little house. That's me right there in the middle of the screen. And then you see these uh, Digipeter objects. This is a vehicle down here. You'll think, see things starting to populate in. And this is just a, a standalone application that can be used on a computer to be able to visualize your APRS information, as well as sending messages and things like that. So that's Yak. And the other one that I wanted to show, these guys away for a second. So this is my phone, and I go on my screen. Okay. So this is my cell phone, and I have APRS Droid on here. And with APRS Droid, the initial view is just my own station, and I'm not sending any information out or receiving any information at this point. If I hit this start tracking button, I have this APRS droid configured to connect directly over the internet to the APRS IS. So if I hit start tracking, now it has started beaconing and I'm gonna start seeing station information come in, right? And so you can see it's just sent mine out and station information is coming in as it receives packets. And it also has a map view as well, where let's see. Where the map is. So, All right. So you can see my icon for this station is a little handset like a telephone. And I'm using the SSID 5 for this. And so you can see as that information populates in, we'll be able to see there's that KF7 DPX guy over here, that vehicle that was in Merriman. And you'll see slowly other things start to populate in as it receives those packets. I'm obviously not going to sit here and leave this on for half an hour while we watch it, but uh, you get the basic idea of how that works. back to this view, stop cracking, and I'll close that down. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to show in my demo was my Kenwood THD72 radio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And you may need to click on me and make me be like the, the main guy here or whatever, so you can actually see what's happening. This is my Kenwood THD72. This radio has full APRS functionality and a full TNC built into it. I can connect this to a computer or my phone or something like that and access the APRS information. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. You can see on the screen, I don't know if you can, is that, that's not mirrored for anybody else, I hope. Uh, basically, you can see it's starting to receive packets via RF. There's a packet that just came in. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. All right. So one of the things that I can do with this radio is, remember I talked about the tune functionality? Um, if I was to find, let me see if I can find one uh, in the list here. Let's see. So I can I can get a list of packets as they've come in. You can see that. And if I was to find one in here that's another station, let me find one real quick.
can find somebody that's sending it. Okay, so here's one. This is W7PEC7. I'm just going to page through the information that I can see here. So it says moving, and then he has some information that is encoded, and then it says, I'm Philip. This is my 878. So he's on an Anytone 878 radio. Uh, it has his direction and bearing from me. His course and speed and altitude. And that's his coordinates. And this shows where I heard it from and where it was last heard through. And then that's the time and date that the packet was received by me. So if he had been sending out his frequency information, I would be able to select that and press a button on my radio and it would automatically tune to the same frequency that he's on. So that's one of the cool features that you can do with a radio that has it integrated, has APRS integrated. I can also push the message button and send him a message it's really painful to dial in the letters using the front panel or the knob on top of the radio, but yes, you can do it. And I could compose a message and send to him. And theoretically, he would receive that and, and respond. Uh, I'm not going to see if he actually does respond, but uh, it does have that capability. Um, let's see, this one, this one is a, a weather station. So you can see it shows me weather information right here on my radio for where this station is located. And I can see the temperature and the wind speed and things like that. So pretty cool functionality. You come right down to it. All right, let me go back to my screen share. Go back to presentation. All right, so I've encoded here a bunch of links to specific information. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. Um, you can look through these. I assume we'll put these slides up somewhere where people can get at them. And um, then you can, uh, can access that information. And are there any questions? We're good in chat. Dan, can you lower your desktop? Thanks. Okay, looking for questions out there. Raise your hand or put something in chat. Crickets, crickets, crickets. <laughs> Dan, you're just too good. <laughs> I will comment that uh, you did an excellent job. I thought you did a very excellent job. I've no, been using AP, APRS for, oh gosh, I'm not even sure anymore, good 15 years maybe. And I have an eye gate and it's running out of a little raspberry Pi in the basement that's been running for uh, several years as well. Never have to touch it, it just works. There's nothing more to do with it than that. We use APRS and balloon launching, like we said. We just had the Great Plains Super Launch out of um, Huntsville, Alabama last weekend. Um, yeah, not field day weekend, but the previous weekend. <laughs> and uh, launched uh, six or six balloons or so. Look it up under, under um, uh, arhab.org, amateur radio high altitude balloon, arhab.org. Or you can look it up under superlaunch.org. And you can see some balloons that are still floating around the Earth. Uh, we fly Pico balloons that will go around the Earth any number of times, uh, sometimes as many as 20 times. It might take three years to go around the Earth that time. The big weather balloons you see are 
uh, the latex balloons, they usually generally go straight up in the air for oh about a hundred thousand feet if you're if you're got it balanced out correctly, maybe hundred and twenty thousand feet. Balloon pops, it comes down sometimes uh, within a mile of where you launched it. Sometimes it's hundred miles away. <laughs> one of uh, one of our guys that on that uh, GPSL launched his uh, right there from the Swirl Building in Huntsville, Alabama, right near the Space Center. And uh, he made the mistake of thinking that two balloons would make it go higher. The two balloons only uh, make it go further. One of them popped. The other one was still had enough uh, hydrogen in it to carry it further. And he landed one mile, one mile to the west of uh, of um, Georgia. So he went an awful long way to re uh, recapture his balloon. But it was led right to it using APRS. It's used all over the world. Excellent, Excellent job. I'm very impressed. Thanks, Keith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you want to raise your hand or put a question in chat, we can get two of here. One in chat. Uh, Mark wants to know on APRS5, what is W, T, T red, and a black star green, or green, black green star mean? Is there a guide for that? So typically when you see the stars, those are typically digipeters, but the other overlay letters, that kind of depends on what they want to use it for, whoever posted that object. I don't think there's ever been anything standardized. There, there may be. Um, I will say if you go to APRS.org, you can find all of the original design documents for APRS, and some of those things are mentioned there. Uh, but keep in mind that that web page was originally created in the 80s, and it looks like it. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, it, it can be tough to find your way around it. And Bob is no longer with us to um, to decode that information. I, I was fortunate to meet Bob a couple of times. He would come out here to Utah to go to the small satellite conference uh, up in Logan every year for a while. And... He would always do a presentation on APRS and it was great to be able to, to meet him and talk to him about what he was doing and how he was working with the radio manufacturers and the different kinds of things that they were trying to include in the radios. So uh, it was a pleasure to get to know him and a really sad day for amateur radio operators all over the world when he passed. So uh, I see somebody is posting red is Winlink, red D in a diamond is D star. So that's good to know. Yeah, and Dan L has got his uh, hand up. Go ahead, Dan. So first off, great job, Jan. I want everybody to know um, uh, he's my right-hand man in the Murray Amateur Radio Club, and I rely on him as is quite obvious. He is extremely knowledgeable, and it's great to have his association. Uh, I don't but know if I'm that knowledgeable, but uh, I found that when I want to learn something, if I teach a class on it, I will learn more than if I just attend a class. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know awesome. a lot. Let me tell you. My question to you is, uh, I've been seeing a bunch of uh, little radios or some type of unit that you can hide in your car uh, that use uh, APRS. Do you suggest a, a particular type or where i could find something like that and have you you know done anything with that because i think that's a great option if you don't want to you know spend hundreds of dollars a year for you know low jack or you know other uh, implementations so the problem with those types of systems those are called trackers and there are a number of different ones that are out there uh, there have they've been out there for years I think Tiny Track was one of the first ones. Um, typically, those are transmit only. So they do not know if the frequency is in use before they start transmitting. And they don't know if they've suffered a collision when they've transmitted. So they don't back off appropriately and things like that. So I don't really recommend using those. But if you're in an area where there's not a lot of APRS going on, um, you know, you could probably do something like that as long as you set it up so that it only transmits when the car is turned on, for example. You wouldn't want it transmitting every 10 minutes all night long while it's sitting in your driveway, right? So, right. Um, but 
yeah, I've, I've seen those before. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of them because like I say, they, they are not good network citizens on the APRS network. And uh, bi-directional trackers are out there, but they're typically more expensive. And by the time you start getting into something like that, there are probably other solutions you could use, like slapping an, Air an Apple AirTag on the back bumper of your car or something like that. And, and it would probably work just as well, if not better. Excellent, thank you.